Lesotho is a tiny landlocked country within South Africa. None of you guys probably know the geography of Detroit, but Hamtramck is completely surrounded within the city of Detroit, so I always try to tell people it's like the city of Hamtramck. So it's completely surrounded, um, and that gives it a unique kind of, it's, com you know, it's completely dependent on South Africa economically. It's part of the South African Customs Unit and the South African Development Communities, two economic uh, you know, free trade and whatnot organizations that exist there. Um, but it's completely landlocked and it's not very developed. It has about roughly 30% unemployment with that rising way above for anyone under the age of 25. So unemployment's widespread. Uh, the HIV prevalence rate has been hovering in the top three for the last 10 years or so and that's about just under 25%. So one out of every four people roughly is statistically um, in suffering from HIV. If not, then surely they know someone or someone in their family, and that has economic, social, whatever, multiplying effects. But also, so you have one-fourth of people affected by HIV and one-third of people without a job. Obviously, um, it's, primar it's uh, primarily rural, pastoralist, meaning they like, you know, love raising livestock is one of the prevalent cultural activities. Um, <clears throat> but obviously in serious need of economic development. And most economic development initiatives, either from the United States, South Africa, whatever, haven't been really sustainable or successful. And uh, James Ferguson, I don't know if any of you guys do economic development, but he wrote a book on Lesotho, directly saying how, showing how NGOs and governments that are insufficient or not necessarily capable, it results in bad development. Um, so, Moving to cannabis or Daha within Lesotho, it arrived from India with uh, medieval Muslim traders in the 10th century. Almost immediately, it was established as a as an, uh, it was established as a crop with cultural, medicinal, and economic exchange uses. Um, so there's actually a story, and then you know it hasn't been necessarily confirmed. But by the time Jan van Riebeck arrived in the 17th century in South Africa. It was completely prevalent for all three of those uses. And there's actually a story that the Khoisan people, the traditional indigenous people of South Africa, the Basutu were kind of migrant people and they're moving south. And allegedly they bought all of Lesotho uh, with Daha, giving it to the Khoisan people. And you've probably heard the Khoisan pejority referred to, pejoratively referred to as Bushmen. You're not supposed to use that name, but that's, they're a unique um, ethnic group within South Africa and Botswana. Um, so when, you know, you had about three or so centuries of prevalent use, and then once colonialism hits, Daha becomes, quote, a Muhammadan distraction. So um, marijuana gets kind of, and this happened all throughout sub-Saharan Africa, it becomes a, a, a victim of colonialism, um, and especially like neo-imperialism, neo you know. So by the time of the early 20th century, before uh, independence, you have prevalent use, an illicit status, and the development of illicit markets, both at the regional, or yeah, re national, regional, sub-regional, and international level. Um, you know, even as the markets are still illicit, for instance, South Africa sucks in a bunch of marijuana from Malawi and Lesotho, and it's also pumping it out to European markets, and it's going to DRC. So you've got intersecting layers of economic um, activity. So independence, long story short, nothing changes. The same colonial, whatever, neo-imperialistic laws just get rolled over. So within the last 10 years, um, you have, in the, according to the UN Office of Drug Control, the total global illicit cannabis market is valued at $140 billion per year. About 3.3% of the people in the world use marijuana, but that's over twice as high on the African continent. So you have widespread use, illicit markets, structures, and behaviors. Um, just to briefly add on, and just to reinforce it, uh, smoking marijuana, growing marijuana, using marijuana, exchanging marijuana is very common in Lesotho, and it has been for 400 you know, years. So why am I looking at it? If you're an economics person, all the factor requirements that um, marijuana requires to grow, Lesotho has, and they don't really have much else. So they've got soil, marijuana, obviously hydroponically growing it, you're going to require inputs and better, yeah, I know, I don't want to, you know, I'm not, I'm not a grower, but you can grow it outside in low quality soil. It will grow anywhere. It, it grew accidentally in my yard, just from people walking through. It can grow. Um, obviously, we're, you, you know, you guys had some really great insights earlier before I got in here. 
you kind of have to check those when you're talking about a completely different um, international economic sure. setting. Um, but they've got three, the Lesotho is more or less the same as Colorado, 300 days of sunlight a year, uh, plenty of water flowing down from the mountains. As you see in the bottom right corner, that's the Katse Dam. Those are the major infrastructure projects that they've done since the 1980s, which the apartheid government kind of forced through at, with a coup. But the point is they've got dams. <laughs> And so there's potential for that. And despite, you know, I, I don't want to, given that I'm here as a human rights person, it does require relatively unskilled labor. Obviously, there's a tremendous potential for exploitation. And the, ver the level of skill can vary depending on the type of product that you're trying to put out there. But let's be frank, it doesn't require a, a university degree to cultivate marijuana. And that's a good thing. Um, so Lesotho, like I said, it's incredibly mountainous. It's, it's more or less Colorado. They've got the only ski place in Africa there, which is like a red mountain with a single strip of s snow. It's a bunny hill. It looks awful. Um, but within Lesotho, you have multiple indigenous high CBD strains. Uh, the most famous one is coming from the other side of the Drakensbergs, and I'm sure you've all heard of Durban Poison, which was, I believe, uh, two years ago, the highest selling strain in the state. And I believe it's still... It's been bred into everything, and it's still one of the highest selling strains. So if they could get IP for that, oh, imagine how much, you know, tremendous amounts of money. Um, so in 1999, a French gentleman named, uh, on behalf of UNESCO named Laurent Lagnel, he did a report on the Daha markets because he wanted to know what was happening when they were displacing all these people to build the dams. So what he found out, and I think this has to be somewhat inflated, but no one's ever checked back up on it, so that's what I'm hoping to do. Lesotho supplies 70% of the marijuana in South Africa, which has one of the highest prevalence uses globally, not to mention um, exchange value. And in certain rural areas like Katse, which is uh, in my district at the very at the edge of the mountains, but especially in Tabaseko, which is in the mountainous interior of the country, 50% of household income um, was from marijuana. So people are using this to buy you're talking about people in extreme poverty using this to buy HIV medication, necessary foodstuffs, household investments, paying for their kids' school fees, which is not necessarily free. It's important. So generally, you can see my general question is what's going to happen because... But what happened in 2016, Lesotho became the first country in, on the African continent to legalize medical marijuana for export only which means no one can legally smoke marijuana and no one can transport it. You have to have a license and you have to sell it to one of two Canadian companies, basically, or excuse me, one Canadian, one South African. I am still exploring official partnerships with them, despite how much everyone here hates corporations. So I've left their names out, but we, I'm really excited to talk about that after. Um, I agree with most of the criticism you guys said, but I, one step at a time, right? Yeah. Um, so the Ministry of Health is tasked with licensing, oversight, regulation, and dealing with all the excise revenue of the marijuana export firms. And just to, it's happening. They've been doing it for two years. Cargo ships full of marijuana have been entering Canada. Um, and I can even bring up the t exact type of strains that they've been producing in these grow houses there, which is completely, nothing like this has ever been done on the African continent. Yeah. So the old model is on the left. It's mainly co-planting with maize um, in these rural, so also so that they can't see it from above. There's the practical aspect. It is probably some of the lowest quality marijuana you'd ever hope to encounter in your life. You spend more time taking out seeds. If you were to just roll a joint, it would be exploding because of the <laughs> amount of seeds that are inside it. Poor quality because small scale production in the interior um, the inputs going into it are not exactly high value. So you have numerous decentralized producers, and they would then either bring it to my town, which was on the border, or one of, you know, Maputsway, Hlotse, these towns on the border, which is where most people live on the border, um, where it was either just sold to the smugglers, and I don't know if anyone's ever been to South Africa or the continent, but those are the most ubiquitous taxis. They're called combis. They're everywhere. You throw a couple bales in the bottom, you take it to Johannesburg and you uh, triple your profits. So you either sell it or give it, to, you know, consign it to smugglers, and these people take it through um, the taxi ranks into Johannesburg or Durban. Um, the border at Lesotho, it is not hard to get anything across there. What you had, though, mainly is a decentralized network, 
where small scale production is occurring. And so now the, the main question is what is going to happen with export? How am I doing on time? About five more minutes. Okay, cool. So what, are we, what do we expect to see? Anyone who lives in Colorado should be um, a little bit more familiar. This is what I would hope to see. This is not actually what I expect to see. But the general trend, you'd hope, is decomposition of the illicit market and economic growth, which is generally what you've seen here in Colorado. Um, illicit actors, I know it's a little different in California because they've got a little bit more established illicit networks, and people are very concerned about the, the quality of what's going in. My friends there refuse to go to dispensaries yes. because they're yes. using the, there's poop and dust mites and whatever. Um, but the point is, in Colorado, you don't have the you don't have a significant amount of illicit actors. You'd like to see employment, right? Thirty percent of people unemployed, and I know a lot of people here are familiar. You get primary employment dealing directly in the dispensary, dealing directly with the product, but you get secondary and induced employment, security guards, accountants. Um, it has the a, the potential to create a multiplier effect for economic development. Um, you'd like to see, you know, the corporations want to see profits. And that, to a certain extent, is not something that's necessary for the whole industry to be viable. Otherwise, why would anyone do it? Um, I, and excise revenue, you know, we were told growing up in Michigan that somehow the lotto was going to save our education system. Um, but I know that excise revenue is used here in Colorado, and that's people kind of wonder what's that, you know. I think a lot of people think of it about it as a black box. I don't think they really understand where that money is going or if it's getting put to efficient use. Um, so yeah, and then you, of course, skill development. And the key thing that I would like to see, and the, the only thing that Lesotho can possibly hope for for a long-term sustainable industry, is the development of manufacturing, uh, intermediate products, extraction. That's how you solidify your first mover advantage, because anyone can grow marijuana. Yes. Um, but the costs, we don't know. Uh, increased health care, maybe more accidents, higher prevalence of use, social externalities. We don't know. So this is what I want to go study. There's three possible things that I see happening, and it's incredibly touch and go and incredibly dynamic. Number one is the status quo continued, which means that Basutu are only allowed to export marijuana, not smoke it, not sell it in their own country, and South Africa keeps it illegal, and everyone else in the region keeps it illegal. If that happens, I envision that the small-scale producers will not be affected because there will still be a tremendous regional demand in South Africa. So you would get, this is your kind of best case, get your cake and eat it too scenario. You get the economic growth of the corporate industries. You have the small-scale producers still able to sell their products in regional markets. And you have, okay, possibly some externalities. Um, obviously, that's not a very stable equilibrium, but people should be benefiting in the short term. Scenario two, South Africa legalizes marijuana. South Africa more or less legalized it. They're in a two-year hiatus period figuring out the details, just like my home state of Michigan is in a year period where they're figuring out the details, even though no one can get prosecuted. And right now, it's my understanding, I do not believe you can get prosecuted in South Africa, or they're just not willing to. Not that it didn't take a $20 bribe to get out of anyway. But, um, well, it's true. And that's another thing about this, too. Chocho, the bribing, like, that's part of this whole process. And things that you can bribe your way out of are problematic economically. Um, so if South Africa legalizes, that's bad for Lesotho. Because one of the companies is South African, they can just start growing themselves. South Africa more or less has an uh, absolute advantage over uh, Lesotho economically. They've got cheap labor, they've got better production facilities, they've got more resources. It's just hard for Lesotho. And anything Lesotho mm -hmm. does is going to have to cross a border and get hit with a raid. Um, so that's not great. But it should still retain some demands. Scenario three, though, and this is looking increasingly likely, is that everyone, there's a domino effect across the region. Malawi, Chamba, Chamba? Yeah, Malawi Gold. Malawi Gold. So the three C's of the Malawian Kambe, or economy are Chamba, Chambe, and the word for fish. I can't remember it. Chambo. Chambo. So fish, tea, and marijuana. It's, that's Malawi gold in bundles on the bottom right. Uh, on the bottom left, Zimbabwe has already legalized Mbanje, and they're also deciding, that they're, they're looking to do it exactly on Lesotho's model, and they're looking to license with Canadian companies as well. So there's a lot of different situations, and no one knows any of these could happen within the next year or two years. So I've got several hypotheses. 
the government has decided to fund my research. Um, so in New September, I'll be traveling back to Maseru, the capital. And really what I'm looking at, I want to center my study on three uh, groups of actors. Corporate actors, the Ministry of Health, and smallhold rural farmers. Obviously, I have my own personal... I care about the smallhold rural farmers more than obviously, and I'm concerned more about the effects of this on them. However, I have to be realistic with my studies. There are different audiences, and I need to be able to... And I'm also, you know, in the interest of not having my students arrested, I need to show that corporations can profit. I need to show that governments can profit. So while I do really respect a lot of those criticisms, I do think it's important that, I be, that I'm working with all these actors. Um, I would like, to, my, the whole point of my studies really is to get us to a point where we can better incorporate those exact criticisms that I was hearing before I started speaking. But generally, as you can see, how much, what, what, how much money is there in it? Can we create corporate social responsibility linkages? One of the companies says they're handing out hot meals in one of the towns. That's bad development. That's not very sustainable. Right. But it's something, so what, you know, no one knows. Can we do that? Can that be done in America? Could they be doing that in Detroit, where my students are, to, you know, with our employment or some other schemes? Um, so, as you can see, those are some of the indicators that I'll be looking for in the bullet point. Um, I would really like to learn and partner with the Ministry of Health to know how much excise tax revenue is being taken. And really, this would be the best question that I would like to answer is, how can we use ex how can developing countries specifically not developed you know like America but developing and really low income how can that excise revenue be used and can it be used to um, help balance of payments uh, terms of trade and other deficits and of course most importantly like I said the smallhold rural farmers what's the effect going to be on them um, I've already explained that they're in a precarious position already and changes could be really bad. So, yep, this is just, this is pretty much the end here. Um, my thesis is generally that transitioning marijuana industries, and when I say transitioning, I mean from illicit to licit, according to a capitalist paradigm, will create opportunities for individual and community economic development, possibly even an industry with increasing returns to scale. So that's something where you've got kind of an R&D locked in advantage, where you're only going to make more money with the sophistication of your products. Um, corporate social responsibility and social welfare linkages are crucial for leveraging cannabis legalization into social improvement. So specifically what I'm looking at, um, these are herd boys on the bottom, that's tremendously, and a lot of what I've done personally is uh, work with gender and youth, um, and very specifically with camp gender empowerment and things for guys to learn how to treat people more equitably, <laughs> if I'm not putting that into great words, but I work a lot with young men. And that's a really prevalent, they're already using, and there's high rates of domestic violence. And so in what ways could we use this intersection to improve social? And so can we, you know, economically, can we establish first mover advantage? And then what kind of, you know, the, the ones that we're already asking here in America, how could we affect incarceration, unemployment, and these other unknown costs? So that's a lot. Thank you for listening. Kea Leboa, as they say. Uh, the first question involved kind of what we call in economics uh, establishing first mover advantage where, and this is pretty intuitively, you know, easy. If you're the first person to start selling lemonade, yeah. you got the advantage. And, and if you are the first person, by the time someone else opens up another lemonade stand, you're able to fund pink lemonade because you've already been making money. Um, so whether that's going to be possible is questionable because in one sense, yes, that is a phenomenon that, Econom economists have witnessed for you know years across a lot of different industries. On the other hand, marijuana isn't very difficult to start up. Um, it doesn't have a lot of you know these start initial costs, and it's not something where if you just keep it static and don't develop the industry, it's not something where you can get. The more marijuana you sell, isn't going to get you increasing profits. So you need to develop basutu vape pens. You need to develop special basutu dabs with the Mishwe Shwe, the first king, branding, you need more sophisticated products. Um, will they be able to do that? Both the two companies roughly say they are. Right now what the companies are doing um, is growing relatively high quality marijuana in greenhouses. Sure. So they're not using that. So they've already improved the product. But it's my understanding too that a lot of what is being grown is 
for processing. So, so if they're dumping all this, and I question, you know, like how people are, are people going to be as um, critical about the status or quality or, you know, testing of their flour if they're really just dumping it in to make bulk extract anyway. So there's a lot of, um, I need to learn more about exactly what the, the intended uses of the product are, whether if it's for processing, whether if it's for bulk flour sale. Um, it's my understanding that most of it is for processing, and they're also experimenting trying to get these indigenous strains that have high CBD counts. They're trying to incorporate those into the product. Yeah, so because you know there's obviously quite a high demand for that right now, um, and they're they're working on that. I don't know if it's happened. So they have improved the product. Generally, they're not using the traditional, you know, um, methods, but. I think that they, they, there hasn't been enough time necessarily for Canada to give them all the, the necessary feedback. So the question was about uh, to what extent will the unfolding of or the transitioning of the industry occur to the capitalist paradigm? In a developing country. In a developing country. I, 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 you know, it's going to occur according to a capitalist paradigm because there are simply, maybe in South Africa it could be different because in South Africa you have the EFF and more, and the ANC is highly socialistic, although completely more or less ineffectual. Um, but there's the potential for that in South Africa and that's something that I'll be really interested to see and I would not be surprised if we see it in South Africa because they have more ability to um, cooperate and you could even see, you know, land is on the docket for being redistributed. So there might be opportunities in South Africa. In Lesotho, um, and this is just kind of hard, difficult to explain, but Lesotho is more or less dependent on U.S. foreign aid and Chinese bilateral agreements. So they, the government is pretty pro-capitalist. The culture is pretty individualistic. Um, and I, I, you know, this is, I don't want to sound condescending or, it's almost like their, their level of economic development in their unique contingent history precludes a more socialistic um, conception of the industry. So the question is, what, why Lesotho, more or less? And um, maybe you could say, like, use that to predict who next, maybe? Um, I would say it's never any one factor. It's always a combination of factors. Certainly one can be stronger than the rest. But in Lesotho, you had this confluence of economic deprivation, prevalent cultural use, um, and medicinal. Like my, my ancient host grandma would boil the seeds and was swore by that. Um, so you've got medicinal use, cultural value, deprivation and existing networks of exchange. I think when you have all of those, the, you, certainly other things can affect it because every country is different. Every country is going to have different formative factors. But when you have things that are all trending in one direction like that, I think they're going to uh, kind of mutually reinforce one another. And I think Lesotho, I think too, you're just kind of, you know, Certain scientists believe that things happen in paradigm shifts, and I think we're really kind of at the edge of a paradigm shift where we've had all this pressure going against uh, pr these bogus prohibition regimes for so long, and finally that cumulative pressure is going to result in kind of a large-scale movement or change, and, and, it, and it's, it's not something that's so necessarily continuous that you can say, like, oh, we were this close to legalization 10 years ago. It's like for 50 years these things piled up on one another and then there was like a, you know, static change, you know, just a, a complete shift in the paradigm. Um, so I think that any country will have different factors that will affect it, but I think those are typical ones that if people are doing, are using marijuana, don't view it as evil, and have, and exchange it or are willing to exchange it, they're willing to consider economic legalization, especially as the rest of the world no longer demonizes it. So the question is, can they compete with the MNCs? Um, there's a, this is a great question. Um, the MNCs are multinational corporations. I would say they do not have to. They are being subsumed into the global value chain. Um, is that a good thing long term for you? Probably not. Um, if you're just making the, the lowest, you know, least costly chips in the computer and then shipping them off to another country, is that going to 
is that going to secure you a significant place in the industry? Probably not. So like I said, it's all about how, to what extent can they make this process dynamic and turn it into first mover advantage. Um, because like I said, anyone can jump in and cultivate marijuana and the multinational corporations are just going to use that to their advantage. Who's got the cheapest labor? Well, let's race to the bottom because that's generally what they do, right? Um, so in that sense, Lesotho should experience short-term profits because they're getting business where business didn't exist before. They're getting jobs, wages where there were none. However, long-term, if you're stuck on the low end of the global value chain, you're never going to be getting IP profits for your iPhones. You're never going to be functioning at the highest level like an American firm or you know, a, a Western firm. Um, so I would say it depends on what, in what way they're able to leverage their relationship with the uh, MNCs. You can't expect altruistic conduct or development priorities from the MNCs. That's one thing I will say. It's tough to work in sub-Saharan Africa, especially when you're trying to do stuff that involves legality and government institutions or just any institution or any group of people. Um, so I'm realistic, but I'm very excited because I personally, I think every day I wake up and I think it's a blessing that I get to study things that I truly care about and that have affected me. So that's one thing. It's really, I mean, like I know I'm being selfish saying that, but it's, I think you should all, if you're doing what you love, that's something that's important. I've already mentioned in depth the ways I think it can be of value to Detroit and Lesotho. Which are really, I don't really care about much else <laughs> except for my pastoral little, you know, parochial little, not pastoral, parochial little affiliations. Um, but I am very excited. I'm very, I love, obviously, I love the country of Lesotho. I, I still have, you know, I've got a name and a family over there um, that's not my own. They still treat me like that. So, I mean, how can you even put into words when people treat you like that? Excellent. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.